This is part two of Frank Lloyd Wright and the Taliesin Massacre in Kubrick's The Shining. Recall that in part one, it was determined through an analysis of uh, The Shining that Kubrick was trying to call our attention to page 193 of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography. And in that uh, video, I decoded a hidden message that was contained on that page. For this video installment, I'm going to continue my analysis of page 193. It turns out that there is another message, another hidden message here to share with you. And I've outlined the new the text to be an, analyzed in red there. As you can see, it's uh, lines 1, 2, and 3. Again, recall that in part 1 of this video series, lines 4, 5, and 6 were decoded. So what is it about the first three lines that I think are interesting? Take note of the fact that in line one he uses the word murdered and in line three he uses the word kill. So having these two words in, in, used in such close proximity to each other when uh, as I've demonstrated in, in part one there's a secret code to be found in line four, five, and six this is a, an indication to me that there's something of interest here to investigate and so that's what I intend to do for as, for this video series for this video installment now in my previous videos where I've decoded messages I think I've always been fairly uh, methodical and precise but for this particular message as you will see I want to be very clear about what I'm doing and, and how I'm um, proceeding and the reasons for this will be clear uh, when I show you this decoded message here on page 193. I just want to make sure that it's very clear to you that I'm in decoding this message I'm following the cues and, and clues that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Stanley Kubrick have provided for us and so with that I want to get to the first point I want to make. At the bottom of this page we're looking at here, page 193, Frank Lloyd Wright has done something sort of odd. What he's done is he has uh, inserted an extra letter N there at the bottom left. As you can see I've highlighted in red. There's an extra letter N there and it turns out that this is not the only page where he has done something like this it turns out that starting on page 17 and proceeding every 16 pages he Frank Lloyd Wright has inserted a letter of the alphabet at the bottom left of the page on the page and on the bottom right of the page as you can see I've highlighted in blue are his initials FLW so, as I mentioned before, this is kind of odd, and um, I think I know what he's doing here, but instead of explaining what I think is going on at this point, I, I'll wait until uh, I show you the decoded message, and I think it'll become clearer as to what Frank Lloyd Wright is up to here. So I'll, I'll get to this later uh, before the end of the video. So that was the point I wanted to make here is that there's an extra letter N at the bottom of page 193. Now moving on to the second point I want to get into this has to do with the subject of child abuse which I and other researchers of this movie feel is permeating uh, is an undercurrent permeating this movie The Shining. For starters, uh, consider again the group of messages which have been decoded. When you look at them from the point of view of uh, child abuse, you'll notice that four of these messages uh, contain references uh, to, to this subject, uh, pederast, abuser, and molester. So this, I think, is an indication that this was something that Kubrick was concerned with when he made this movie. Now, encoded messages aside, the fact is that when you consider the movie itself, other people have remarked that there does seem to be a vague and subtle uh, reference uh, references to uh, the issue of child abuse. And um, I went over this in a 
previous video, uh, part four of the significance of Playgirl magazine in The Shining. So uh, you can go and look at that if you want. Uh, I just wanted to quickly summarize here that uh, this is an issue which uh, this movie is concerned with and it, it will have some relevance to this uh, upcoming decoding message that I'm going to show you. So that's the second point I wanted to make that The Shining is concerned in some level of child abuse. Now on to the third point I want to get into and that has to do with murder and death both on an individual level and on a widespread level. Now on an individual level I think this is pretty obvious and it hardly needs really explaining. We see explicitly individuals who are either being murdered or have been murdered and we literally see the word murder written on the door there as you can see so this is this is really a no-brainer as far as on an individual level is concerned now as for murder and death on a massive scale this isn't something that is discussed a whole lot with this movie but uh, I believe that the imagery that we see in this movie suggests that this is something Kubrick wanted to uh, uh, relay to us I'm sure you remember this particular sequence of images from the movie. We see it several times. Uh, the, the enormous amounts of blood pouring from behind the elevator doors here. And the sheer amount of blood pouring from this elevator is evocative of the deaths of many, many people. And furthermore, when you consider carefully the exact images that we see in this sequence here, we can come to uh, a more specific uh, conclusion as to who is actually responsible for the, these uh, massive amounts of deaths. In uh, part three of Kubrick's Catcher in the Rye Code, which was, a, which was a previous video series I did, I made the argument that a lot of the imagery that we see in The Shining is referring to the Rothschild family crest, which you can see there on the right. And you can go back and visit that installment if you want. The important point I want to make here is that one of the facets of the Rothschild family crest is a red shield. And the connection to this image is that those elevator doors can be thought of as red shields. So with this image here, Kubrick is accusing the Rothschild family of being responsible for death on a massive scale, not just an individual scale. So that is the third point I wanted to make. Uh, moving on to the fourth point, uh, this has to do with cannibalism, uh, both explicit and implicit references to this subject. Now this isn't something that you hear a lot about when people are trying to analyze this movie but the fact of the matter is that Kubrick has Danny and Jack explicitly talk about this subject while they're driving on their way to the Overlook Hotel and what I want to do now is just to refresh your memory play that this clip for you when they're uh, talking about cannibalism Dad? Yeah. Well, you should have eaten your breakfast. We'll get you something as soon as we get to the hotel, okay? Okay, Mom. Hey, wasn't it around here that the Donner Party got snowbound? I think that was farther west in the Sierras. What was the Donner Party? They were a party of settlers in covered wagon times. They got snowbound one winter in the mountains. They had to resort to cannibalism in order to stay alive. You mean they ate each other, huh? They had to, in order to survive. Yeah. Don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. Saw it on the television. So clearly the subject of cannibalism was explicitly discussed here at this point in the movie and at this point I want to ask the question 
is there a point to, to this? Is there a point to having the two main characters in this movie have a discussion about cannibalism? Or let's reframe the question here. Given that we know that Stanley Kubrick was very precise and very meticulous, he was a perfectionist as a filmmaker, he was extremely detail-oriented, is it conceivable that he would make a horror movie where two of the major characters have a discussion about cannibalism and yet this subject has absolutely no relevance or purpose at all in relation to anything else that is going on in this movie? When you approach this question from this point of view, I think it's fairly obvious that it's entirely reasonable to assert that Kubrick was trying to draw our attention to this subject for some purpose relating to this movie. And so what I want to do is I want to illustrate to you that there are, in addition to this, these explicit references to cannibalism, there are numerous implicit references to cannibalism. For starters, let's consider this conversation that they had. When you look at uh, the frames that I've labeled four and five, you can see that um, it's, uh, it's stated and then emphasized that Danny saw uh, cannibalism or he learned about cannibalism by watching television. Now why is this significant? I think that Kubrick is trying to draw our attention to the fact that the first time we see Danny Torrance he's uh, watching television here in the uh, Boulder apartment uh, with his um, mother Wendy. Now we don't actually see the television but it's been determined by other researchers of this movie that what Danny is watching is a Looney Tunes cartoon featuring the Coyote and Roadrunner. This cartoon that he's watching is called Stop, Look and Hasten and uh, this is a screenshot of the Wikipedia page and um, I'd like to point out an interesting fact here. As you can see there on the bottom right, it was first aired on August 14th, 1954. Now, this is striking because this is the eve of the 40th anniversary of the Taliesin Massacre, which, if you will recall, occurred on August 15th, 1914. I just uh, thought I'd point that out to you. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, this, uh, this cartoon features a coyote that is uh, preying on a roadrunner. Uh, and uh, here's a screenshot from this cartoon, uh, Stop, Look, and Hasten. Um, it's, uh, this pretty much is the plot of every coyote roadrunner cartoon. The coyote is always trying to eat the roadrunner. Now, if you were to say that, strictly speaking, this isn't an example of cannibalism, I would agree with you. Absolutely, it, it isn't. Um, but what it is an example of is predator prey. And uh, I would uh, make the argument that cannibalism and predator prey are, cr are closely related. You could say that cannibalism is an example of predator prey because it's, in a, it's a situation of humans preying on other humans. So if you wanted to take this, look at this from a mathematical point of view, you could say that cannibalism is a member of the set of predator prey. Moving on to another example of implied cannibalism in this movie, I want you to consider the scene where Dick Halloran is giving the inventory of frozen meat at the Overlook Ho Hotel. Now, as you can see here, after he gives the inventory, he turns and he asks Danny the question, question do you like lamb, Doc? Now, how is this uh, an example of implied cannibalism? Keep in mind that Danny is a young child, or in other words, you could say that Danny is a kid. Now, one of the definitions of kid is a juvenile goat. So, one could take the point of view that Halloran is asking a kid if uh, he likes to eat lamb, or in other words, he's asking a kid, a goat, a young goat, if he likes to eat lamb, which I think one could argue is an uh, example of cannibalism. 
And furthermore, I think it's worth noting that Halloran asks Danny this question while they're literally surrounded by dead meat. For the uh, next example of implied cannibalism, I want to have a look at the scene where Jack uh, starts chasing Danny with the axe. Recall that uh, immediately after he kills Dick Halloran, uh, he uh, starts chasing Danny with the axe. And what I want to do for you is play that clip here. So let's think about what happened in this scene. Immediately after Danny gets out of a kitchen cupboard, Jack starts chasing him with an axe. And when we're looking at this movie, The Shining, with the idea that cannibalism is a subject that Kubrick wanted, was uh, concerned with, then we can view this sequence here as Kubrick suggesting that Danny was uh, a piece of meat that somehow sprouted legs and he was there then being chased by an axe-wielding maniac who wanted to cut him up into little bits and eat him and again this is this is evocative of the what we saw earlier with the coyote chasing the roadrunner uh, to try and eat him as a final example here on the subject of cannibalism I want to consider the scene towards the beginning of the movie where Halloran and, and Danny have their discussion in the uh, kitchen of the Overlook Hotel. I would like to draw your attention to the knives there directly above Danny's head in the background. If you look carefully you can see that there are five of them and I point out in part three of Kubrick's Catch in the Rye Code that I believe this is a reference to the Rothschild family crest. Keep in mind that one of the elements of the family crest is five downward pointing arrows. Now, in addition to that, I want to point out there, directly to the right of those knives is a meat cleaver. By arranging this scene in this manner, uh, with, with these items here placed as they are right above Danny's head, and within this context we're having of, uh, about concerning cannibalism, I think the implication that Kubrick is getting at here is uh, pretty clear, if not very disturbing. So that's the fourth point I wanted to make, is that there are explicit and implicit references to cannibalism in The Shining. Moving on to the fifth point I want to make, when you look at lines 1, 2, and 3 of page 193 of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography, uh, you'll see that on the letter J occurs exactly twice, and in both instances they are capitalized, as I've highlighted in blue. And the last point I want to make is uh, the fact that in the ballroom scene, after uh, Delbert Grady collides into Jack, Torrance and uh, spills the drinks on his jacket, they start walking towards the men's room, and just before they get into that room, Jack uses the word soiree, and what I want to do to uh, refresh your memory on that, or to illustrate this point, is to play the clip of that incident here. I think the best thing is to come along to the gentleman's room, sir, and uh, we'll get some water to it, sir. <laughs> Looks as though you might have got a spot of it on yourself there, Jeezy, old boy. <laughs> that doesn't matter to you. You're the important one. Awfully nice of you to say. Of course, I intend to change my jacket this evening before the fish and goose soiree. <laughs> Very wise, sir. Very wise. So, as you can see from that clip, Jack uses the word soiree. And so with that, uh, I'm done making the points I wanted to make. Now it's time to turn to the decoding process of lines 1, 2, and 3 on this page we're looking at, page 193 of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography. 
And to refresh your memory, we're going to be decoding the text there up at the top that is highlighted in red, the first three lines. Now, as you can see here, I've transferred the text and I've broken it down according to the frequency with which each letter of the alphabet occurs. That is indicated by the numbers in blue. So now the task at hand is to rearrange these letters into the message Frank Lloyd Wright wants to convey to us. And towards that end, as you can see on the right, I've included the six points that I've made throughout this video that I believe are relevant towards this effort. Now, the message that I'm going to show you is a preliminary message because, as you will see, it's not quite done yet. Uh, now, as you can see here, um, you can see why I took so much uh, time and effort to explain what I'm doing here. But, and I'll reflect on this message uh, shortly. I want to draw your attention to the word orphan there on the last line. You can see that that word is missing the letter N. As you can see, there, the, the letter N occurs 10 times in lines 1 through 3 on page 193 of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography. And we need 11 uh, N's to complete the message. We need 11 N's to co in order to complete that uh, word there, orphan. But keep in mind that the first point I made is that Frank Lloyd Wright has included an extra letter N at the bottom of page 193, as you can see there on the, on the bottom right. And so if we had that N, then we could complete the word orphan and we could complete the message. And at this point I want to address the question of why Frank Lloyd Wright put that N there. So there are basically two possible scenarios here. The first scenario, scenario is that it's just a complete coincidence that Frank Lloyd Wright put a letter there at the bottom of the page that we just happen to need in order to complete the message. That's the first possible scenario. The second possibility is that Frank Lloyd Wright put that extra letter there to accomplish a couple things. One was to indicate that there's a secret message on this page to be decoded and also um, it's a way to uh, cryptically verify that the message at which we arrived previously is the correct message. Now, um, if I believe obviously that the latter scenario is the case, uh, given the fact that, remember, Kubrick, I believe, used The Shining to direct us to this very page. And so um, I believe that by far the most likely scenario is that Frank Lloyd Wright wants us to use this end to complete the message and so that is what I'm going to do going forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in that extra letter N there as you can see the capital letter N there on the far left is uh, from the bottom of page 193. So now we have 11 N's and now we can complete the word orphan and we have arrived at our final message. And what I want to do at this point is um, just explain a couple things about this message that may be unclear to you. I want to uh, first draw your attention to that French term there I've underlined in green, en masse. Uh, the typical spelling there is uh, M-A-S-S-E. However, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, um, spelling it the way I have, have there is an acceptable variation. And as you can see on the bottom there, I've included uh, the entry from the Oxford English Dictionary that I have. Now, also, uh, the initials HGF there in parentheses, that is referring to Herbert Grady Fritz. Uh, his name pops up a lot. He was the draftsman who was working at Taliesin at the time of the massacre, and it's apparently the case that um, he was uh, the one who, uh, he was one of the ones who carried out uh, the massacre, and he, uh, it appears that he was the one who actually killed Mema and her two children. So now I just want to take a little time to reflect on where we are here. As I said at the very beginning of this video, I wanted to make it very clear that uh, in decoding this message I was following the, the cues and clues given to us by Frank Lloyd Wright and Stanley Kubrick and I just want to emphasize that that is the case. My only 
um, motivation here uh, is, for, as it has been from the beginning, to get some sort of, to come to some sort of understanding as to what Stanley Kubrick was up to when he uh, made The Shining. And this video is the result of that effort on my part. So you can call into question if you want um, my strategy and, and the conclusions that I've come to, but if there's one thing I want to emphasize here is that this video is the result of a good faith effort on my part to understand The Shining. And this video, again, is a, an effort on my part to share with you that effort. And obviously, if you have a problem with anything that I've done or how I've gone about things, then you can leave a comment in the, in the comment section or you can make your own video where you come to your own conclusion. At any rate, uh, this, is, uh, this is what it is. And what I would like to do now is to combine the two messages that we have. The message that we got from part one and the message that we have here. And the reason that I want to do this is because when you, when you look at these uh, two decoded messages together, I think you just get an overall more cohesive understanding of uh, what Frank Lloyd Wright is trying to explain to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the text from these six lines here that I've highlighted and I'm, I'm just going to uh, combine them the, the two messages that we've gotten in parts one and parts two so as you can see here I've combined both sections there on the left in blue and again that N is from the bottom left of page 193 and I just combined the two decoded messages there as you can see so the last thing I want to do is take this uh, combined decoded message and juxtapose it with the text on page 193 which I've highlighted in red there and I, I did this because I think it, it really gives a, a, an overall picture of what Frank Lloyd Wright was trying to is, is trying to tell us and what I find striking about uh, this message when it's presented in this way is it it drives home the point that Frank Lloyd Wright and MAMA were not uh, just going to blow the whistle on one individual person. They weren't just going to reveal uh, that Nathaniel Charles Rothschild was uh, a pedophile. They were going to blow the whistle on a whole lot of very, very powerful and wealthy people. And um, I, think, I think that really uh, changes things here as far as uh, one's understanding of what Frank Lloyd Wright and MAMA were up against. So that's why I wanted to uh, put together this, uh, these uh, decoded messages the way I did. So uh, with that, I think that's enough for now. Um, I do plan to come out with some more videos. I don't know when. I intend to pick up where I left off uh, with the Playgirl magazine. Um, there's, believe it or not, more to uh, go into with that. Uh, at any rate, um, I'll stay tuned and I'll see you next time.